Pia Giacomo, it's great to have you with us. I would like to present you to our audience with a few words. Pia Giacomo Severini is working at the University Gabriele D'Annunzio in, in Chieti, uh, Pescara, Pescara, I think. Always again, he will talk uh, uh, about Shan, Shan Hirsch's philosophical term to responsible freedoms and with the focus on what rights need to be human. A few words, Per Giacomo graduated in philosophical sciences at the University of Macerata in 2016 with a thesis which I find is a wonderful on the tragedy of action in different interpretations of Sophocles, Sophocles uh, Antigone. He was a visiting PhD student at the University of Zurich from September 2018 to 2019 and defended his PhD thesis in human sciences in 21 entitled Being is doing with freedom and existence in Shanghai. He's a postdoctoral researcher at the University Gabriele D'Annunzio di Chieti Pescara since February 21 and working on a project entitled Shanghai between philosophy and human rights. And I think his talk is, has something to do with his research. Thank you, uh, Pia Giacomo, for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you for the presentation and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining this talk. First of all, please let me thank Professor Agen Gruber, Clara, and all the organizers of this inspiring event, because you know, we have seen perfect organization, great talks and friend environments. So really, thank you. I am glad I can give my contribution presenting Janelle's reflection on such a burning issue as human rights are. So we can go. Uh, okay. I would like to start with a few lines from Eclaire Obscure, which state the importance of the commitments to politics and human rights to Jeanne Hersch since she was a teenager. Hersch writes, I've always believed that it was a primary right of every intellectual, artistic, or physical human being to see clearly in order to know where she is to be placed in space and time in order to be able to make a net of free, conscious and responsible presence towards the world around her. I realized very soon that many human beings, because of their birth, their social condition, are hindered in such development. This is, in my opinion, the fundamental inequality. I was therefore interested in politics because it is through it that the human beings strive to act on their living condition and those of their fellow. It seemed to me that by this way, it was possible to influence reality and ensure the development necessary for human freedom. As the lines we have just read confirm, Jean Hersch spent her whole life trying to enlighten human dignity and how to increase possibilities of freedom. First of all, in the first part of her life, she reflected on freedom from a theoretical point of view, deepening both its relationship with reality and its role in human existence. In the second half of her life, after having elaborated a theoretical system, she tried to state the real conditions for preserving and enhancing freedom, practically committing herself to promote freedom in her time. Although it is impossible to recall her commitments here, the aim of this talk is to present some consistent passages of the Ersian reflection on freedom in order to point out some original aspects of this philosophy at the threshold between realism and existentialism, which should be taken into account when theoretically reasoning on human rights. This talk consists of three parts. In the first part, I present Hersian theoretical investigation leading to the definition of inner freedom. This reflection on a subjective level is relevant because it constitutes the theoretical foundation to understand 
the urgent contribution to politics and human rights. In the second part, which is the most important one in the present talk, I analyze a Hirschian contribution on politics and human rights, which should enhance inner freedom, guaranteeing other conditions of liberty. In the third part, I will indicate some relevant points that to me could help in preventing a naive approach to human rights. So we can go with part one about the definition of inner freedom. As I have already said, Hesch spent the first half of her life reflecting on freedom on a subjective level. From late 20s to late 30s, she proposes a metaphilosophical investigation on the original roots of philosophy and its peculiarity. It is in those years that freedom explicitly comes in as the ground of philosophy and human existence. After having reflected on the central role of actualizing the capability of freedom in human existence, Hirsch focuses on an ontological investigation on the incarnation of such freedom from late 30s to late 40s. I won't have enough time here for explaining in details all those concepts, but I hope they will become at least a bit clearer in the next slide. If this is not the case, please feel free to ask at the end. And maybe we will also have the time to see a couple of quotations about inner freedom that I will not be able to quote during my presentation. Since she was a child, Hersch was interested in reality and the real existence of what the subject perceives. So her bachelor thesis, entitled Les images de l'œuvre de Monsieur Bersong, starts a metaphilosophical investigation of philosophy, studying the use of images in Bersong's main work. In Berson, she retraces a freedom as an organic development, namely an original actualization of a natural and necessary tendency. This is the first time Hirsch speaks of freedom, but she somehow clashes with such definition because on the one side, it states the relationship with the world and she appreciates this, but on the other side, such relationship is not enough since it leaves no room to the human moral commitment and action in the world. Hersch finds the answer she was searching for thanks to her mentor and professor, Karl Jaspers. Inspired by Jaspers, Hersch publishes L'Illusion Philosophie in 1936. In this text, she pushes further her metaphilosophical investigation, analyzing the philosophical problem. The philosophical investigation starts in the world being at first a scientific investigation of it. But such scientific investigation of the world presents some logical cracks that cannot be explained theoretically. In those cases, the subject is not supported by knowledge and she must solve the problem taking a decision. The decision can be taken only actualizing the capability of freedom, namely choosing freely something worthy to which to be faithful. Thanks to such decision, the subject determines herself and her object, thus starting to exist. Furthermore, since there is no certain knowledge that can help to decide in those cases, such decision becomes a metaphysical proof that founds the existence of the subject. So the philosophical problem leads us to decide our metaphysical proof and philosophy is about the metaphysical truths decided by the most famous philosophers in the history of philosophy, which should be an example for us of how actualizing our own freedom. So at the end of her metaphilosophical investigation, Hirsch understands that philosophy is an authentic experience that shows us the way to use our freedom in order to exist. And we cannot have a total scientific knowledge of the world. So we have to find our metaphysical truth, starting from it, and to actualize such metaphysical truth in the world thanks to our freedom. After finding a foundation for human existence, Hirsch deepens the actualization of metaphysical truth in daily life. So in 1940s, she brings forth an ontological analysis of the incarnation of human freedom, especially in the text Lettre et la Forme. 
from such analysis, it emerges that the world is full of objects that are appealing for the, sub the subject as a singular cipher of a transcendent value that is not real yet, but deserves to be. The subject tries to exert her hold on this objective matter, but she cannot penetrate it, so he gets just a form, namely a new real object that reworks the original matter in a subjective mode, thus constituting the subject's reality. Such process of giving form is what Hirsch defines incarnation. In daily life, the faithfulness to the subjective metaphysical truth that founds existence corresponds to the incarnation of the forms, building a subjective reality that orders the natural world in a new mode. And such new order is the human ontological production to Hirsch. The result of Hirsch's research on what she defines inner freedom is the awareness that the human being must always deal with the real datum. And freedom is the capability to want an object more or less holy, and thus to incarnate the transcendent value that the subject glimpses into material objects. There are different levels of freedom, and when the object glimpses the wholeness of the highest subjective transcendental value, the subject will be obligated to hold such matter, incarnating in the world a form that is totally original. The freedom at this highest level is the freedom that Hirsch wants to preserve through politics and human rights. And so we can move to part two about guaranteeing other conditions of liberty. Let's switch again the slide. In order to understand why reflecting on other conditions of liberty is needed, we can start again with a quotation from Hirsch. She writes, freedom is the condition of meaning and also of the meaning of the sentence denying it. There are people who say that freedom exists and want to mean by this that its outer conditions are fulfilled, negative conditions, no impediments, positive conditions, sufficient safety, keeping vital needs at a distance, information and training, etc. In this regard, it is necessary to make an important point. The outer conditions of liberty do not correspond, as some seem to believe, to a state given by nature. On the contrary, some rules, laws, guarantees, and obligations are needed. Hence, the paradoxes that accompany every effort to improve the conditions of liberty. There is always a risk of abusing the indispensable obligations, but the state of nature only allows the reign of the strongest. The reflection on other conditions of liberty is based on the two empirical findings. First, the human being is body and soul. So we need to preserve our body and to keep our vital needs at a distance. Second, the state of nature only allows the reign of the strongest and it leaves no room to inner freedom, which indeed is a free act that goes beyond natural determinism. In addition, we have to consider that we need to use our force in order to incarnate our freedom, risking to damage the other subjects. Before going deeper into Hirsch's reasoning, let me make a couple of remarks. First, Hirsch's texts on politics and human rights are generally not translated in English, and this could lead to an ambiguity since the French word liberté could be translated both as freedom and liberty in English. But luckily, we have a couple of texts that Hirsch has written in English which can be clarifying. The first text states, now we come to the concept of concrete liberty, the conjunction of political rights with social rights. The second quotation states, freedom is not something that can be ensured even by a political constitution. When we speak of political liberty, we are using an expression that is inexact and apt to lead us into error. About the second remark, here is a fast reference to some key events about Hirsch's continuous commitment to politics and human rights. I will just 
remember some of them. In 1956, she published Ideologie Realité, which is her most famous text about politics. Then between 1966 and 1968, she was the director of UNESCO Division of Philosophy. And at the end of her mandate in 1968, she published the collection entitled Le Droit d'être anonyme. Uh, finally, in 1920, she published Le Droit de l'homme d'un point de vue philosophique, which is as her most important text about human rights. So let's see in which sense Politics can guarantee better and better other conditions of liberty to more and more people to perish. The central awareness of ideologie et réalité is that evil is always present as the possibility of damaging the other subject in self-affirmation when using force in order to incarnate one's freedom. Here, Hirsch distinguishes between force and power, proposing three different levels. At the first level, we can find the animals and all who use force in a deterministic way. At the second level, some power emerges as the ability to use force in view of an end, which is exactly the case of the subject of inner freedom that wants something. At the third level, on an intersubjective plane, the power of politics gives birth to an entity that preserves the inner freedom of its members. In the specific case of politics, the power is a melange of force and morality because the good politician must use her force in order to preserve from evil what is worth. To explain the purpose that politics want to give itself through the power, Hirsch resorts to Kant and Machiavelli, the two that best describe the theoretical purity of the moral act and of the success. The unconditional criterion of evaluation of the politician's work is the success in preserving what has a moral value to her. And here we can have a look at the lines in which politics arises in ideology and reality. Hirsch writes, the political problem consists precisely in establishing a system which, while allowing rulers to govern, limits the evil that they, need, sorry, that they may be led to do. It is about inventing a control technique. The problem of control arises when the person of the ruler separates from the force. Therefore, when this force chooses to appear as a natural or providential prolongation of her body. From now on, the use of force must be justified. The ruler refers to a moral, recognizes an authority, calls for control. Politics is for The citizen's freedom is the moral value that politics must preserve. But such freedom is slightly different from the subjective capability of deciding freely. And it rather resembles an empty space that every citizen can eventually fulfill with her inner freedom. Hirsch calls political liberty the freedom that constitutes the end of the power in politics. And here we can read the second quotation from Ideology and Reality. The same word freedom is used in two totally different ways. In the philosophical sense, freedom designates the presence of a subject that intervenes in what she is not to transform it, to give it meaning and value. We stumble here with political liberty. In itself, it is nothing. Properly speaking, it is not freedom, but only the possibility of a free presence. It preserves something indispensable. It does not have the character of a choice that follows a deliberation, but that of a necessity that bases the same sense and the possibility of a choice. We can see that thanks to political liberty, politics find the formal negative duty of avoiding the evil disrespect of the other's inner freedom. But this cannot state an universal valid way in politics. So politics is founded on what Hirsch defines practical antinomy, namely the ever-present need of using force in human nature 
risking to do evil. In front of this, politics must dialectize force with morality in ever new modes, avoiding two ways. The first way is the angelism of those who reject politics because of its link with force and evil. The second way is the enslavement to totalitarian ideologies that impose themselves as the only possible ones. We have seen that politics can just reach a formal empty space to have faith in. Given the difficult task of growing against the natural current to guarantee the outer conditions of liberty, a positive and solid foundation should be needed. Hessian reflection on human rights should give such foundation because it tries to prove that every human being has the fundamental or the absolute exigence of deciding what is worth for her and being recognized in such capability. Such awareness was already present in Illusion Philosophique, but in the definition of inner freedom as the capability of deciding the subjective metaphysical truth. But le droit d'être un homme should work as a demonstration that the fundamental exigent is a universal foundation of the human nature. This text is a collection of worldwide testimonies that are prior to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to demonstrate that the human capability for freedom was recognized and claimed in every part of the world in every time. It is important to understand in which sense Le droit d'être un homme can work as a demonstration. To Hersch, a universal capability of the human being for deciding beyond the biological and the universal need of mutual recognition of this capability emerged from the prayers, the items, and the traditional teachings collected in the text. Logical intellect can read here just random texts from different traditions, but by integrating reason with imagination, we can hear the voice of all the people that fought and are still fighting in the name of what is worth for them, being ready to die for it and struggling for their capability to be recognized. Again, it is possible to glimpse this all only going beyond the scientific objectivity. And in this regard, we can hear again her words. Only in this way, at this intersection of the opposing realms of nature and freedom, the human being can feel a fundamental exigent living in herself, regardless of the different cultural expression. Simply because she is a human being, something is due to her respect, attention, something that safeguards her possibilities to make of herself what she is capable of becoming the recognition of the dignity that she claims because she is the only one to consciously aim at future. Every human being wants to be a man and to be recognized as such. If she is not, she even prefers to die. The demonstration that the fundamental exigence is a universal foundation can only be felt and no pure intellectual operation can catch it. We need a philosophical turn in order to understand the unnatural task that is at stake. Such turn must be philosophical because philosophy can conceive something beyond nature, broadening the horizon to recuperate the problem of meaning alongside the natural order. And hopefully I will come back to this point in the conclusion. Finally, it is possible to see that a responsible freedom arises next to inner freedom. After the reflection on politics and its practical antinomy, it is clear that to Hersch, freedom always needs force. This may lead to evil and to disrespect or even deny the other's fundamental exigence, which is as important as ours, as we have just stated thanks to the reflection on human rights. So being free is not enough. And we have to be responsible as well. An existence must incarnate its freedom while respecting the other's inner freedom. In this regard, Hirsch proposes a method and two principles for enhancing human rights through responsible freedom. 
regarding the method, using freedom responsibly means being tolerant. To Hirsch, when we are tolerant, we are not indifferent to what is true for us, but we know also that the other is in our same condition. So a double absolute arises in front of the free and responsible subject, the absolute of one's exigence and the absolute of the other's dignity. Regarding the two principles, a responsible freedom will never be neither a pragmatic neutrality nor a fundamentalism that justifies the use of any means, because it is always aware of its not own transcendence and the absolute decision of the other. Starobinsky perfectly summarizes the characteristics of the Ersian freedom at the end of her world path, so we can have a look at what he writes. This freedom involves the following characteristics. It is virtual, it is not a datum, it is a conquest without possession by a subject that is created through this conquest itself and in front of it. It must be actualized and conquered in the available space and live in the reality, in situation. It is responsible because on the one hand, it implies self-control, respect for what is essential. And on the other hand, the principle of possible freedom and responsibility of others. Finally, it is an absolute exigent for the fact that every human being feels that something is due to her. So moving to the conclusion, we reach part three, which is the last part of my speech. And uh, we can ask, what are the relevant points of Ersian reflection on human rights? And how can we learn to fight consciously for human rights? I think that Hirsch can help us to consider what rights really need to be human. First, we can exist thanks to freedom, but we also have a body. So we belong both to the realm of ends and to the realm of force. We have to use our force to achieve our ends. We are not evil, but evil becomes possible if we do not work on natural conditions through morality. In this sense, Hirsch is right when she says that we are neither beasts nor angels. She says that when reflecting on human rights, we cannot be neither beasts without an end nor angels without a body and all that it involves. Second, from a political point of view, the justice that should protect the space of political liberty can learn from human rights that it resembles equity. Every citizen has a fundamental exigence that is different from that of the other. So politics must be equal in guaranteeing the best outer conditions of liberty and possibilities of incarnation to every human mode. This is possible only thanks to tolerance, because understanding and leaving the fundamental exigence of the other is the first step for enhancing this all. Third, the awareness that the philosophical problem implies a radical alternative, which could explain the reason why human rights are not respected in many parts of the world, as we can see nowadays. As we have already seen, saying yes to the philosophical problem means starting to exist as a subject, while saying no to it means ignoring it. It means remaining an object among many. Human existence with its yes to the philosophical problem and human biology with its no to the philosophical problem are both real possibilities as two opposite modes of staying in the same one world. Just to name some possible cases, external difficulties can arise when actualizing our yes thanks to freedom, like blackmail or maybe emergency situations in which we must first think of surviving or maybe internal difficulties may arise, like the burden of freedom, which Dostoevsky perfectly describes. In all those difficult situations, the no to the philosophical problem is always a real alternative. It is exactly here that freedom is the foundation of the whole Hirschian path, because no total and objective truth 
can overpower the autonomous human decision between existence and biology. But we can see the fundamental exigence as a universal foundation of human rights only if we decide to live in a world in which the transcendental value can be glimpsed next to objects ruled by natural laws. Fourth, it is true that a philosophical turn is needed because the absolute exigence can be only felt when we decide to understand and live tolerantly the absolute decision of the others, thanks to our imagination. This operation is not natural, and it rose against nature in the name of what is worth. As Hirsch says in her reflection on politics, it is in this way that morality must educate force. And we have seen in the very beginning that philosophy is about the free human decision and faithfulness beyond natural determinism. So this is the reason why philosophy can help in the unnatural task of guaranteeing human rights. And the human rights to have will never have a legal force, but always and only an ethical force, an ethical one. Fifth, it is essential to remember that the freedom through which we incarnate our fundamental exigence is responsible, namely that it remembers the two principles of the not own transcendence and the absolute decision of the other. We always have to remember that the mode we decide is subjective and it is a metaphysical truth just for our existence without stating something about the objective truth, the truth with the capital T. Only in this way, we can prevent us from fundamentalism because the fundamentalist person and the free existing person both share an absolute exigence, but the fundamentalist one speaks in the name of the truth with, with the capital T, while the free existing one dialogues with and respects the other's truth. Sixth and last, I would like to add something on the kind of freedom that founds and must be preserved thanks to human rights. I think that an even more radical alternative is at stake when reasoning on freedom, the alternative between a certain logical truth and freedom itself. On the one side, if a certain and knowable logical truth was possible, then the freedom described by Hirsch would be impossible because we would have had the duty to say yes to such undeniable truth. On the other side, if we had to prefer freedom to the truth with the capital T, then the risk of irrationalism could come in. Hirsch manages to preserve from certain answers that can be accepted once for all. Since the fundamental exigence, as we have already seen, can be only be felt and not demonstrated. But some positive formal principles are still available for the subjects of the philosophical term. So Hirsch conceives a freedom that wants us to discover what counts for us and to incarnate it. But this still preserves the possibility of different modes of incarnation. This means exactly obliging us to go to our existential route without the constraint of content to any specific route. In my opinion, this is the main point of strength of the Ayrshire reflection on freedom. In our double effort to incarnate our existence freely and to preserve human rights, we have some formal indications that work as boundaries. But as Starobinsky recalled, Freedom is also spiritual, and it must be actualized. Freedom has a foundation, of course, but it also needs to be an endless task, since adhering to a perfect and total truth would mean giving up on the subjective free research that is involved in human nature. And uh, I think that's all. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>